I am super excited about today's episode. Uh, this person changed my life in a way <laughs> that no, listen, stop laughing. You, she changed my life in a way that isn't the norm or predictable. She's not my therapist. Janine gave me curls, but real quick, hold on. Before I introduce her, I want to, I want to give you a little backstory. Uh, since I was, uh, 11 years old in the eighties breakdancing, uh, I became obsessed with hair. And I think because I was the smallest kid, I had to have cool hair. And so I had, um, um, Aquanet and I would try to make like a pompadour cause I had the, the Asian straight bowl cut. Oh, for, God. You know, that is yeah. like the hardest. <laughs> I know it's like it, the most opposite situation. My parents, um, just, you know, give me no style. Uh, they put me in a, a strawberry shortcake t-shirt when I was really young. They didn't know that was for, for girls. Um, so I had this pompadour, um, in the eighties with, you know, disco and breakdancing with Aquanet. And then throughout the years, I've always, you know, had all these different hairstyles from, you know, bangs to long hair, short hair. I shaved my head once looked horrible. And uh, always been insecure about hair and always playing with my hair, always wishing I had different hair. Enter Janine. And uh, <laughs> she said, hey, John, we're going to curl your hair. And I said, no. Um, I dated a hairdresser back in the day, and uh, I wanted wavy hair. Of course, we always want hair we don't have. And I gave myself a perm, or she gave me the perm. It was horrible. And uh, I looked like a Lego man. It was, it was, it was not oh, good. Oh, God. Yeah. And then um, – but so when, she, when Janine said, uh, let me give you curls – I was like, ah, I wasn't sure, um, but her confidence gave me the 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 trust in her, and um, she gave me curls, and I fucking love my hair now. Oh. It's easy, and the thing about curls is you don't have to put product in it. You just have to wake up and go, and uh, then as I got to know her, I realized that there's a uh, there's an amazing story behind this person with um, her own curl line, which we'll get into. Uh, and so that's why I have you on my podcast. I think you're going to be inspirational to so many women because of your story and what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm your therapist. You're my therapist. Yes, you are. Yeah. So real quick, let me take a breath. Janine Jarman is founder of Curl Cut, the first ever protein perm and hair texture line. And she's also the owner of Heroin Salon in Los Angeles which is kind of a, an epic, I would say uh, it, it's foundational in Los Angeles. Uh, she's had many locations, um, a nationally re-owned celebrity hairstylist. She's obviously done hair to many celebrities. She has uh, been hair obsessed for as long as she can remember. The self-proclaimed perm queen is bringing back the perm with a launch of curl cut in salons nationwide. Wide. So um, you could find out about her, her product line, um, and her salon all in the show notes. But let's get to our story. You grew up where? I grew up um, Long Beach till I was 13 and then moved to Huntington Beach. Um, my mom wanted us to have the opportunity to go in the 80s, yeah. I guess then early 90s, um, to go to a better school district. So we like mm. bought a – like well, not foreclosed house. What was it? Like a condemned house? They, the lady oh. was like, was, um, a drug house. <laughs> no, no worse, worse. Um, you can get that smell out. Uh, it was <laughs> illegally breeding cats. So oh, gross. yeah, oh, it was so God. gross. But my yeah. mom, man, she, you know, like I, that like is probably the start of my story is my mom and dad always just hustlers. Like yeah. my mom bought this house that nobody wanted. And we fixed it up. We tore out the carpet. We, I mean, we spent like, I think a good six years trying to get rid of the smell of cat pee. Um, and we did to like everyone else, but like it haunted me and her, sure. you know, we, we ended up getting another house in Huntington beach, but yeah, she made like, she made a killing on that house. And she always, always her and my dad, both, uh, even though they're not together, they're still best of friends. Um, so doing the impossible. Well, let me ask you this. I, I love what you're um, saying because it's thematic in your life, also with you and your yeah. husband. Oh, um, totally. You, you said hustler. So tell me about this. You growing up, uh, what made your parents hustlers and what did you learn? Because obviously you're, you're, a, you're a hustler yourself. I mean, you have it in your blood. 
So you, did, yeah. you grow, did you grow poor, middle class, rich? How did you grow up? I don't, I mean, I think now that I'm older, I think not poor. Like we're mm -hmm. fine. Like I never went without anything. We are definitely had mo more money than a lot of the other people in a poor neighborhood when I was younger. Right. right. Um, but my dad was self-employed. He started a wallpaper hanging business when I was born. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just uh, both creative, hardworking parents. So I think a lot of times when you're, you choose creativity or that, you know, that's your, your skill set, um, you have to do a lot, oftentimes a lot more jobs mm -hmm. to, to make ends meet. I mean, yeah, like I, yeah, I never went without, but like we weren't poor. And then my right. grandparents, I think had money. But definitely raised in a like you make your own way. Nobody paid for my parents for anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, my mom and I cleaned houses on the weekends for a couple mm -hmm. years. So I guess that wouldn't. <laughs> that's not normally somebody who has a ton of money. Right. Probably don't do that. You guys but, are like you guys are like poor adjacent. Yeah, yeah, but like <laughs> fine, you yes, know. <laughs> yes, and also when you're when you're when you're a child, you don't know what rich or poor no. is. You just know your world, right? Um, so cleaning houses on the weekends, your, your mom, I mean, whether you're poor or not, that is already, uh, the hint of working hard, hustling. Yeah. Um, at what point in your life did you, cause you moved out early, correct? Yeah. I moved out, I think a couple months after I graduated beauty school. So I was 18. Yeah. Um, got my own apartment Where did and you with a boy, with a boyfriend back to Long Beach. <laughs> Wow. I, so you were living yeah. with you were living with um a dude at 18 and you just yeah. had that kind of freedom? You know, no, you know, I mean every my mom was pissed, but right. not like that's the thing too. Like in my family, like if you you like earn you have to earn the right to pave mm -hmm. your own way. Mm -hmm. So like if you want to drive, buy yourself a car, pay for your own insurance, like yeah. that and that was, that was my way. Like I wasn't great in school. I had learning disabilities, mm -hmm. but I always had like three jobs. Wait, so what, I bought kind myself... what kind of learning disabilities? I feel like I've had some too, like dyslexia. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, like a, a, a touch of it, mostly with numbers. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, ADHD that like yeah. my, every teacher every year begged my mom to put me on medication mm -hmm. and she was like, you know, this isn't going to go anywhere. Like, or, meaning like, it's never going to go away. And mm -hmm. her whole point to the teachers was like, is she's not violent. She's not incapable of like graduating to the next class. So I think Janine just has to learn to work through this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's probably an unpro very unpopular thing, but that was, and my dad was aligned with that too, that, you know, unless it was really holding me back or hurting others or myself that, what you're strapped with, you got to work through. And, and I'm grateful yeah. for that. I think I worked my ass off to be a C student. <laughs> like, mm, yeah, me too. I went to tutorial. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that feeling. So when you're finally good at something, which that was hair for me, I never looked back. I was like, oh my God, I've never been good at anything. How did, and, you know, how did you know you were good at hair? What happened at a, at a young age where you're like, okay, I'm bad at school. I'm, you know, whatever, but this is my yeah. power. I'm good at this. I know. I, so it was the nineties, right? Mm -hmm. The like Pamela Anderson era. Yes. I yes. would do my hair in these big, just inappropriate updos for yeah. high school. Right. And older, um, girls in the school asked me to do their hair for the dance. Mm -hmm. One girl in particular, Yvonne, Yvonne Pearson. And I worked at a bikini shop. So I did her hair on my break in the dressing room for mm. homecoming court she won and then all her friends wanted me to do their hair the next day oh, which was shit. the homecoming dance she was yeah. the billboard for you she uh, she was <laughs> she was my tipping point yeah and so yeah i just started doing that and then teamed up with um another girl who was like a super cool girl named noel mm -hmm. uh who did all the makeup like she did her makeup beautifully and then everyone would go to her to get their makeup done go to me so we teamed up um and that's when I always knew I wanted to start my own business because I loved going to work with my dad. Um, during the summers, I always went to the construction sites with my dad. Mm -hmm. Pre-internet, you know, handed out job assignments. And um, I loved it. Like a, yeah, as a young girl? 
Uh, both. I, I straddle the line of both. I'm like that that tomboy in a dress, you know, that's yeah. Like, yeah. shouldn't be wearing a dress what she's doing. But, you know, I, I, I've always straddled both. both lines. But yeah, I love being on a, a job site with my a dad. dress holding a hammer. Exactly. Picking up <laughs> razor blades and, you know, so wait, wait real, real quick, when uh, just uh, just because I'm a, I'm a dad now, when you were uh, going to work with your dad, yeah, what did you, what did you do all day? Were you just doing errands while he was working, especially in a in a in a field like construction? Um, how how did you keep busy? Well, so he did interior or does interior construction. He mm -hmm. started doing hanging wallpaper. So for the first like little kid years, the '80s wallpaper was like all the rage. Yeah, I would clean up the scraps like I'd walk around with a bucket, clean up all the scraps. This sounds horrible, but I would pick up all the razor blades because you used like right. disposable razor blades. And like when they are dull, he just his him and the guys would just throw them down. So I'd like carefully pick up razor blades, which I'm a huge like advocate for letting your kids do dangerous stuff. I think mm -hmm. it's really good and gives mm -hmm. them great self-confidence because I can tell you. I mean, although, I mean, that probably sounds psychotic, right? Like, let your five-year-old pick up razor blades. I never cut myself, but I had, it really, like, made me feel trusted. And, you know, yeah. I was, like, one of the guys. I, I actually love that. I think in today's world, um, and maybe it's a generational thing, um, the whole helicopter parenting. Yeah. You know, parents not allowing their kids to fall or, yeah. I mean, you know, I know I'm older than you, but I grew up where, I mean, I should be dead. I grew up, you know. <laughs> totally. They, they they would just let us out of the house, and then um, un, un, until the street lights went off, we were just you know doing crazy shit, doing really dangerous yeah. things, you know. Um, and so I don't feel like that happens today, and it doesn't have to be that extreme. But like you're like you're saying, I, I think yeah, we, we should trust our kids to go on their little journey and and and, and scrape their knees and you know fall off the monkey oh. bars, and this, yeah, that's how they learn. I know for I I know firsthand that's where my self confidence began because mm. like you said you were the smallest kid I was I mean I'm four foot ten like yeah. I was yeah. always like are you are you in like a Doogie Howser kid like everyone thought I was like some baby <laughs> right. I'm like no I'm just small and have a yeah. weird voice um but yeah it was that's where my self confidence began was doing adult type of things and yeah you know like i would climb up the ladder and get on the scaffolding to hand my dad you know new supplies and we built i helped my dad build stuff like i always was doing stuff i love that so i mean you going work, work with your dad was almost the training ground for you yeah. to um, build self confidence. I, I love this because it's not about the classroom, right? This is you um, being in a real life situation, work, hard work. Uh, I mean, you're collecting razor blades, you're doing all yeah. these things. This little girl wearing a dress but holding a hammer. Um, and that built confidence. And I love that because um, that's real life, you know? And yeah. so that confidence rolled into uh, now you're 18 moved out on your own and uh you you get you're getting into hair so you notice that your gift is hair because yeah. uh prom and when you're working at the the uh, bikini store you started doing um all the the girls hair and people yeah. thought oh man this is the go to for hair and so oh, what I mean I subleased that? I subleased uh, um when it was dance season we started getting, so me and my friend, Noelle, she ended up being my friend. She's my best friend to this day. Mm -hmm. um, we would do like a package, a hair and makeup package, and oh, we wow. would sublease, and you're talking, I'm maybe 16, sublease for the day. A this space? girl's, yeah. Yeah, we wow, would clean this 16. lady. Mm -hmm. So while, while so, the kid, yeah, while the kids were doing paper routes, maybe that's not a thing. And you, it was yeah. um, you were subleasing spaces already at 16 and doing... Yeah hair slash makeup packages for yeah. dances. Well, and that was the thing is like, I love doing hair, but I totally loved getting clients mm -hmm. and like that experience, that like connecting of the dots and the whole production of it even more. So mm -hmm. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Even before I went to beauty school, I'll never forget at, like my first, maybe first week of beauty school. And they're like, you make a business card and, you know, where I want to work. And I was like, yeah, I want to open my own salon. Mm -hmm. And before I'm 24, that's, or before I'm 25, that's what I said. 
And the teacher's like, nobody opens their own salon before they're 25. Right, like, right. And I, you know, I'd been reading all through. Once I like got good at hair, I then was like, all right, what do I need to do? I ordered a booklet from Barnes and Nobles. Mm -hmm. You remember when you had to like order things from yeah. Barnes and Nobles? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, how to start your own salon. And I filled out that entire workbook. Wow. Like probably my senior year. I read like ha like entrepreneurial books and um, I got that like story that, what is it? Five, 5,000 hours, whatever it was that like the Beatles played this many hours to become an expert. So mm, 10, my hours, plan, 10,000 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it worked really well. I don't even remember what it was. Um, but that was my like quest. I was like, okay, so if I do this seven days a week, mm -hmm. like, and just have as many hair jobs as possible, I'll get that much better faster. And I, I did. I, I had, like, I rented a booth in Huntington before I moved to LA. I worked for a product company right out of beauty school. Mm -hmm. So I worked for the first 10 years of my career. I worked seven days a week. Even when I met my husband, I was like working every single day, either on a photo wow. shoot in the salon or traveling, doing hair. Cause I wanted to get as good as I could as fast as possible. So your dream of opening your own salon before age yeah. 25 actually happened, correct? It did. Yeah. You, you opened your first salon at what age? 24. 24 haphazardly yeah and this was heroin in hollywood yeah 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 we were we're now in our third location we've moved three times yep we were across the street i was working at, i had just moved to la three months earlier i was doing um hair for the pussycat dolls that's mm -hmm. what brought me to la and that was before they or like right they had just turned into a, a pop troupe they were a burlesque troupe before that um but I was driving up to LA like every weekend and I'm like, oh my God, I just need to move up here. I was getting, the Pussycat Dolls wanted me to do their hair, like color and cut. And then I was getting more clients. So I was like, I just need to rent a station up in LA and eventually move to LA. And I mo just moved here. Um, oddly enough, my first, my first roommate when I moved to LA is the, a super famous hairdresser now. She owns her own product line. Her name's oh, Kristen wow. S. Yeah. She has like all these products in Target. So it was like kind of this magic house now that I look back at it. Um, but the salon I was working out in LA went under her and mm -hmm. I'd been saving. There's that other part. I'd been saving. I basically lived off of one job and then all the other jobs I just saved. I saved, I saved. So um, I had never even opened up a statement to see how much I had saved in this Roth IRA, whatever the hell it went. And I had like $30,000 at, 24. Wow. And, and so that's what, what, that's what you used to get the equipment or open or have the lease well, or no. So yeah, the salon I worked at three months into working there, the owner went to jail, mm. everybody left and I was stuck with this abandoned salon. So I contacted the landlord cause there was a 30 day pay or quit notice and took over the lease and made all, you, got brought all the, the bills up to. Can you um, say why current. the owner went to jail or you don't want to disclose that well uh multiple reasons oh, yeah okay. <laughs> yeah and multiple what, what, reasons what was that called before heroin because i i remember it's called seeing lather it. lather beauty lounge mm, and they had okay. one in santa cruz too okay um and what year was this that you opened heroin 2006 okay so let me do a little uh tarantino real quick uh, yeah in in because he, he in his movies will show you a different story or something happening while this other thing is happening. Like the, yeah. the movie with Brad Pitt and, um, you know, the Caprio with the, the, the Sharon Tate murders that was happening in the background. Yeah. He, he does this whole fictional thing with, the, yes. the, with, okay. Well, so while you were doing heroin salon on Coenga in Hollywood, 2006, Coenga was the street that I took every day to get to my family business, the restaurant bar, which was the Hollywood canteen on Seward street. And so, yeah. and this is before Coenga really blew up. It was just kind of a, a, a straight shot, no traffic. And I remember, cause I was so into hair, uh, I was looking for, um, uh, you know, just always thinking about, you know, going somewhere else. And I remember uh, uh, finding someone to do my hair and I remember driving by heroin every day, seeing it. And I remember it looked kind of edgy. It was kind of like, you know, the, the, the font that you had, it was kind of like rock 
leather. And I remember just seeing it. And in my subconscious, I was like, oh, I should stop by. Oh, I should stop by. And for years, I would drive by your salon. Um, and then and then Coenga blew up, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and all of that. But I remember seeing your salon in 2006 on my break from working at the restaurant bar every day and making a note of it. And here we are. Um, not only <laughs> did you curl my hair, but uh, we, are, so we, are, we are friends. Isn't that weird? But yeah, I remember seeing this. I love when like circles interconnect. I mean, and we like as a team would go walk down to Hollywood Cantina and get get some margs and chips. Yeah. And you, you know, um, but this is a very LA story. I mean, LA is yeah. big, big, but small. So at 24, you open your first salon mm -hmm. in Hollywood on a, on a great street, by the way. And uh, how'd it go? What happened? So it was, I mean, I like, I was dumb enough to not like to not overthink it. You know, I was young enough and right, dumb enough right. to just Naive be enough. like, yeah. how hard could this be? Sure, sure. And it was really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot, it's less hard, but it's still really hard. Um, it went well. And then uh, we caught the eye of Urban Outfitters. They opened a huge plaza a couple of years later across the street. Mm -hmm. We're like, hey, come over here. So we went over there. It's great. It's uh, Space 1520. And then they were like, oh, you should also, we're doing the same concept, this like multi-business, anti-mall vibe in um, New York. You should bid for the project. And at the time I was six months pregnant. Wow. And you, you know? were, yeah. And you were 24, 25. Yeah. 24 still. Right. No. So this time, fast forward, I'm, I think I was like 32 by then. Yep. So it was like 10 years in and, um, I just never thought that I would, I mean, I bid for the project against like multi-chain locations, right? Wow. And they gave the project to me. So then I opened New York, which has since closed. We were open for six years there, yeah. but I opened it with a, with a brand new baby in tow. And again, same thing. I like, it was my first time being a mom. I was like, how hard could this be? Yeah. And yeah, oh, yeah I, it was, I know that, it was really I know hard. that very well. Uh, <laughs> so you are a mother now mm -hmm. and you have now two salons, one in New York, one in LA, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I closed the New York one. Now yeah. fast forward, we, during pandemic, we closed it, but yep. yeah, my entry to motherhood was being by coastal and a multi location owner. How do you, how do you juggle that? Because, um, you have two kids, you, um, I mean, now you have much more, but even back then with one kid, yeah. salon, uh, wife, like how did you juggle your life and all the things you need to get done, but also, you know, being present in your marriage and also friendships, yeah. like what was your life like, or did you just focus on work and you just kind of became a No, no, not right. at all. I mean, again, I have ADD. I can't focus on shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, I think that's how I got myself into the, <laughs> this, this mess with this many jobs. I think, I learned early on to um, have uh, this, it probably will sound terrible, but not have um, expectations, mm. you know, to try to yeah. really be present. And mm -hmm. like, I joking, I jokingly say, um, like, I enter the day knowing I'm going to disappoint someone. Mm -hmm. And it might sound really negative, but like, as a boss and a leader, like I'm probably not doing a great job if everybody, if I'm making everyone happy, because my job as a mom and as a leader is to make the hard decisions and to be the heavy. Sure. So um, just accepting the reality of leadership uh, and being very realistic with it and owning it, um, that's probably the, the easiest part so that I don't fall apart with like this b bizarre pursuit of perfection. Like, first of all, what the hell is that anyways? Mm -hmm. um, it's such an individual, like being a mom, being a wife, be like it's so, all of it's so individual. So just, you know, just entering each day, doing doing the best I, I can that day. And some days I can do a lot better and some days suck and just yeah. kind of letting them have their perspective place. But yeah, just just being present as much as possible. So you're now in your thirties, you have, um, one or two children. I don't know if you had two by now. Um, you are, you have a full salon, you've got employees. 
uh, you're also uh, doing hair for uh, some pretty big celebrities, both yep. in music um, and, and uh, music, film, television. Uh, going on sets, doing a lot of that stuff. At what point did uh, the curl stuff come in? Or this is way or way before that? Yeah. Did, did no, you want to go into the entertainment world and do all that? Or did you like on set, you're like, I don't want to do this? So it's, it's tricky. And you'll, you'll appreciate this. It's, you know, certain career, almost every career, like my career being a hairdresser, right? You're, we're told, okay, the best hairdressers do celebrities. Like that's, that's the thing, right? That's the ladder. And I got there pretty fast doing celebrities. I was a platform artist traveling. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is probably one of the bigger learnings I've had is that uh, success is going to look and feel totally different to every, right. yeah, everyone. Sure. Yeah. And once I had cassette, I mean, it was specifically when I was pregnant with my first one. So I'm opening, you know, going over plans, flying back and forth to New York, planning the, the building of the New York salon, knowing I'm going to be a bi-coastal new mom traveling with my kid. Um, and at that time I was doing Ariana Grande's hair and Steven Tyler's mm -hmm. and Ariana Grande was going on her first um, tour. And I mean, bless her. Like she was a teenager. She's like, I'm, I think I was like two weeks from my due date. So gigantic that I couldn't even physically wash her hair. I'm at her house mm. standing on her kitchen Island, like bent over washing her hair. And right. we're laughing hysterically. Cause she's like, don't drop your baby on me. You know, which is disgusting. Get your baby out of my face. But yeah. Was also like very could have happened. Mm. Um, and it was that moment that I'm like, I had to tell her, I'm like, I can't, well, in, even Matt was like, I had to pick, like it was too much. Um, the hours for doing celebrities were just all over the place. So they weren't as uh, manageable as a mom. I, I also and as, like knowing you, I can't imagine you on a set where, you know, you're there for 12 hours and you're basically waiting most of the time. There's so much downtime, right? Yeah. And uh, because of your energy and you juggling so many things, Ugh. I can't, I can't imagine, I, I would feel like that for you would be like prison. Well, as a business owner, that's where it was helpful to be own a business because I could like, oh, you know, run, get run stuff that, done yeah. and right, yeah, right. like kind of run my business during downtime. But it was, yeah. So that's, I stopped doing celebrities when I had my first kid. Mm -hmm. um, my mentor, Donna, who I'd met at that product line that I worked for, she always was like, what's going to be your thing? Like, what's Janine's thing? What product are you going to come out with? Like, I've always been um, in the behind the scenes, a product tester for tons of different brands of giving my opinion, what they should come out with, what it should smell like. So I've had this knack for products and like, and strong opinions. Yeah. Um, it's not shocking. So all the while I, you know, started wearing my hair curly just out of necessity as a new mom, mm -hmm. couldn't find great products. I'm like, Oh, I think I want to lean into this curly movement. Um, I also secretly loved perms my entire life because I thought it was such a punk rock thing to do to permanently change somebody's texture and kind of piggybacking off of what you said, John, like it, it, like it sounds so dramatic, but it can really change somebody's life yeah, and make their hair totally so much life, easier. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? And I think that was the biggest thing that I was like, I love that. I love that. By in two hours, I could give someone drastically different hair mm -hmm. that was not just a easier to style, but b, you know, like completely changed their look and got something that they couldn't have achieved on their own. All the while, also to your point, perms sucked. They smelled terrible. Yeah, and yeah. they looked kind of shitty. Like they were dry and crusty, and not what people want. This they want natural looking curls, and perms just really didn't achieve that. So. If you're watching this on Secretly. YouTube, uh, look at Janine's hair. It's it's very it's full of volume. I mean, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, this I is my natural curl. To be fair, I, this isn't a perm. I inspire perms, but yeah. our perms look like this. Right. This was the benchmark. The, that's the model. Like, that's the model. Look. Yeah. This is what you, even because your hair is yeah. natural and it's full. It's got lots of volume. That's the, kind of the model that you replicate with yeah. product and perm. I remember perms because uh, my mom has had a perm her entire life. Korean ladies have perms. And, uh, you, yeah. you know, it's like the, the sulfur smell and the giant thing that they put over their head. And it was just, um, perms were never, uh, 
they were never cool. They, they, no, they, I think in the eighties they were kind of cool. A lot of people were doing them, right? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and, and, and then it, they went it out was of style. huge. Yeah, so, I think you know now we want stuff that we want touchable hair. So it's like unless mm, perm, right. and that was kind of the thing. I'm like, perms can't come back unless they actually are soft and don't damage your hair. We've we've gone so far with nutrition. With I mean, you, you say the eighties, right? Mm. In the eighties too, we ate fake yeah. food. Right, like McDonald's. it was cool yeah. to eat fake food. Yeah. So we've like really departed from that. So it has to to get perms to come back. You know, I had this deep desire, this bizarre, like burn in my heart to, to bring them back, but in a meaningful new way that we hadn't seen before. And it took me teaming up with a, a like, you know, a, a chemist in Italy mm -hmm. and all together now that we've launched um, seven years altogether of testing hundreds of formulas to come up with a, a patent pending formula that is, better and safer and actually gives you what you want. It doesn't fry your hair. Um, but yeah, and it was thankfully because of the pandemic, which who would have thought? I, I certainly as a bi-coastal salon owner, owning salons in New York and LA, the worst heavy is hit areas. Um, uh -huh. I found myself with time on my hands and I was in a very like, rock and a hard spot where I didn't know if I could financially ever open my salons again. Um, you know, the first three months was unsure is before we had any of the relief funds coming through or anything. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, you know, I better, I better come up with something quick. And I had this perm formula I'd been sitting on and testing and these support products. So I put a business plan together with the help of two girls that worked for me at the salon and one was a hairdresser uh, named Lauren and one's Elvira who she, Elvira has been with me for like 12 years. She opened the New York mm -hmm. location. She's like, she's my girl and whatever she doesn't know how to do, she just figures it out. She's not a hairdresser, but she's like amazing. So this is and an yeah, example we figured of it um, out. This is an example of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset pandemic, obviously shutting down, you know, gym salons, everything. And if you have a fixed mindset, you're going to feel like your world is over. You're going to, um, you know, maybe possibly get depressed, uh, discouraged, yeah. you know, you know, you, you, you just play dead. I don't know. You, you, you know, you start suffering, uh, because you have a growth mindset. When this happened with your salons, um, you decided to kind of pivot and put energy into this curl line, which is awesome. So you became yeah. a mad scientist. You were the guy making the electric whips in the basement. While, you know, while there's, while, uh, while the world yeah. was, was going crazy and then right after the pandemic, then you were able to surface, right? Oh, t I mean, even before then, like there was so much behind the scenes work. Like I fundraised for my first time ever, you know, mm -hmm. I just listened to podcasts and read books and yeah. kind of figured it out. We put together a pitch. We did stuff I'd never done, but yeah. you know, I will tell you the day that we had to close the salon, it took us about two weeks to get everything closed down for both locations. Um, I never kept, there wasn't a day that I kept my pajamas on, you know, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I don't allow myself to go there cause I'm scared of that place. Oh, that, so like, like you mean even at home you're dressing up like you're going to of work. Of course. And, yeah. Putting on the my makeup kids and, too. Yeah. I was like, get up, get out of bed. Nothing changes just because mm -hmm. the world's changing. We have like your, you know, you have to choose joy. You have to choose productivity. Sure. Like yeah. I didn't want to do any of that. I just want to curl up and cry and, you know, yeah. drink a bottle of wine, but yeah. I'm not going to let myself. So yeah, I woke I up and di did what I could. Yeah. And so then the birth of this uh, product line, and now you have a full product line and I, I yeah. use it, right? Tell us about yeah. your product line. what's different and uh, what are some of your goals for this? So Curl Cult, we reinvented the perm, um, and it's a it's a total appro approach to texture and curl care. So if you've got curls, we've got you with our support and retail. And if you want curls or texture or wave or volume, we've got you with our unique uh, patent pending perm formula. So we launched it to, this is a professional product line. So in salons, we have over, I think, 
I think we're approaching like 5,000 uh, stylists that wow. are certified in our method. Um, we've been around for a little over two years. Uh, I'm launching in Canada next week. So we're like finally international. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, um, I, here's what I know. When I go get a perm um, yeah. at, at your salon, whether you're doing it or um, one of your certified uh, stylists, it doesn't have that sulfury smell, right? Yeah. Like it actually does, it smells good. It's pretty quick. Um, it's not the old Korean grandma perms that I'm no. used to seeing. Uh, and then it holds for months. And like you said, and I love that you're comparing hair to uh, other things like nutrition and food and even the way that we get, we work out. All of that has changed so much. And yeah. yeah, why shouldn't hair and hair products and all that change as well? So like um, you can touch your curl, you could put your hand through it. Like you said, you know, people want to touch your hair these days. It's not going to be like, uh, you know, we don't want crusty hairs, Aquanet hair. No. And yeah. And so your products are all kind of like natural and soft, but super effective. Well, and with that, that was the other part too. I'm like, can we have like healthy products, but not make it look like a granola brand? Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. I named it Curl Cult. Yeah. It's all like tarot card imagery. Like I wanted it to feel, you know, like magical, fun and cool. Cause that was something for me in the hair world. I'm like, why does everything that's like good for you have to look like it? Like, why can't we be like punk rock? Like, you know, yes. like a health goth. Yeah. You're, um, you remind me of like hair meets, uh, um, who's the guy that did uh, nightmare, Be uh, Tim. Oh, Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, look I at mean, you, look at your wallpaper. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, it so, is so the packaging, yeah. So the packaging is kind of unisex, but the packaging is, um, I have your products in my, uh, in my, uh, restroom and it's, it's, it's non, there's no gender. And, that, and that, yeah. that's it's always good. been on purpose too. Yeah. I'm like, why well, also does like. Hair stuff have to look like it's, you know, going to a beauty pageant. Like it just, it's hair, hair products are for people Yeah. with hair. <laughs> well, uh, Jenny, thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, I, I uh, applaud, I think you're such a great example of someone who uh, is a hustler, a self-taught growth mindset, also a mom, like doing everything right. And also, you know, um, you're making um, an effort to, um, feed friendships, right? Yeah. And cause that takes work, especially as we get oh, older. Uh, and I'm so saying this important. because I was, I was just at her, uh, her house for a little barbecue and, and we try to see each other and, and all, all that uh, with our families and, and make an effort to hang out. That's important. And so just kind of doing everything. I think you're a great example of someone who, um, started young, built something. Of course there's turbulence, uh, but continued on. Now you've got a full line and, uh, a family and you know, not that it's easy, but um, you're still powerful and you're doing your thing. So I think well, your story is um, inspirational. I'm, I feel lucky, you know, I've got two hands and a brain. I get yeah. to, I get to get up and work hard every day. Like it's, I feel like it's, it's a blessing at the end of the day. It's hard, but it's a blessing. What's the, um, let's end with this. What's the greatest uh, lesson. And I'm sure you have many um, that you have learned uh, uh, as far as being an entrepreneur? Ooh. Um, people first of anything mm. that's ne that hasn't worked out for me. It was, um, people centric, you know, you can have every detail figured out and it right. looks as slick as can be. If you don't treat your people right and you don't have the right kind of people, uh, spend your most time and energy on that. You know, like even you know, at, in like the beginning of owning a business, I was so focused on making everything great um, and always like undervalued, like connecting with the humans that worked for me and represented my brand. So now I realize just me walking the floor and just having, you know, quick interpersonal talks and yeah. it doesn't have to either be and two like with whole with also like upholding boundaries, like, but just connecting and getting to know your employees and what matters to them. And it, it mm -hmm. makes decisions a lot easier for you. And it makes people feel seen and heard and turnovers is expensive and yeah. a pain in the ass. So invest in, invest in your people and the rest will fall into place and be a lot easier.
Yeah, I really believe now, uh, because I have a small team as well, uh, you're only as good as your team. You know, yeah. when, we're, when we're starting out, you want to do everything. And of course, you're learning, you're growing. But once you kind of tip and you start to, you know, um, build companies and product lines and all that, of course, you can't do it by yourself. And so you really have to have an eye for rock stars. But also, like you said, people first have an authentic relationship with your yeah. team because you know, they're going to carry you and you're going to, you're also going to be um, a part of that and, and, and they're going to get yeah. something out of it as well. So yeah, I love that people first. Yep. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, ha thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. And yeah. um, where can we find you? Oh, um, on, on all the socials, uh, Curl Colt and Heroin Salon. Mm -hmm. um, on yeah, on online, you can go to curlcult.com to get the products and find out more about the brand. And you can book an appointment at heroinsalon.com. Yeah. Janine's very Yay. busy, but you can uh, book an appointment with. Um, oh, my team. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I'm a pain in the butt to get in with. Yes. Come see any member of my my amazing team. They're amazing. I promise you will, yep. will enjoy it. Thanks well, for will, having me. This is yeah, so cool. Yeah, I will be in soon um, to get um, another another perm, and um, I will see you and your husband. Actually, your entire family next for uh, Korean barbecue. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. You know, I love <laughs> I love Korean barbecue. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Be well.